cops are allowed to do that. I was at an Afghan market today, and there's just a bunch of Muslim dudes gambling in there. Yeah, and it's like okay. little slot things, and I was just like, okay. "What are your guys' rules?" Because like That's you strange. cannot sell liquor, but yeah. you have those like super cheap like donkey power like sex pills or whatever that you mm-hmm. can get over the counter or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? That you can get like. I'm like, so what are the rules here? Like, is it just like liquor and drugs? That's the only thing you can't do because I mean, otherwise it's well, they, like- they have a they have a rules problem, actually. Like because of the way that it was set up, they have a rules problem, right? So they've got like the things that the prophet said, and then they've got like the hadiths, which is like the the tradition of what the prophet said. But the problem is like they would be so it went from, oh, if the prophet didn't say it, then they would go down to um, like companions. And then if the companion, if they didn't have something directly from the companions, then it would be like friends of the companions. And then it would be like friends of friends of the, co- like somebody knew a guy who knew a guy who was hanging out with Mohammed and Mohammed Mohammed's said this. cousins, veterinarians, accountants, second brother, who knew mm-hmm. a cousin that once said, Hey, it's cool to to gamble. So. And then guys, but but people would would make them up. Like so, for like th- a thousand years, there were like fake hadiths, where just like some ruler would want to do something, and he'd he'd pay like somebody to write a hadith that was like that. Like, oh, the second cousin of the companion of Muhammad from here. That's definitely a religion got of the a- people. <laughs> you know. Well, hello. Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight, I'm going to ask Father Turbo and Cyprian, when you guys are driving, and Cyprian, maybe not so much where you live now, but when you mm. live stateside, when you guys are driving, and you see that a lane is ending, perhaps due to construction or whatever, do you guys immediately go over into the lane that's open, or do you go up to the front and then kind of like do the zipper? Like, have you guys heard of the zipper thing? Mm-hmm. Where you go up all the way to the front, and if everybody does it, it's really, really smooth. You guys, know what I'm talking about? This is this is happening right now in Saipan because they're fixing the roads. So I was thinking about this yesterday. It's very strange that you would bring this up. Mm. I am I am a uh, immediately as soon as I know that it's happening, as soon as possible, I'm getting into the other lane. I'm not a okay. go go forward guy. Okay. At all. No. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. What about, about you, Father? father? It depends. I'm a situational mm. guy. It's I, don't, I don't approach things like that dogmatically. Because you never know. You never know. So. See, and I might say, I think both ways are good. And I agree with Father. Sometimes I'll do both. Sometimes I'll go up. But I think that is the problem. I think we as a people need to come together and pick a lane and i pun intended because the problem in the midwest is especially with the influx of people from the left coast is that Mm. some people fly up to the front Mm -hmm. and then they're like waiting to get in and i think other people immediately jump over and i think that's the worst of both worlds so i think us we can't agree on anything else as a nation right now i think we should agree on this of either just merging right away or doing the zip the zipper thing because I used to think that the people who went to the front were just being kind of, you know, jerks or whatever, because they didn't want to wait in line. But then I found out recently, like, no, that's an actual system that lots of people do, that they just go to the front of the line and then people let them in and it's called the zipper method or whatever. So um, I I do both, but I think that is the problem. I think the problem is that it's both. So, yeah, good topic. Well, I, I think I think it's about also where is your like where is your head at because i think your head is in a good place andrew with the like 
because you want to do the zipper method because you feel like that will be better for everybody. If everybody did the zipper method, it's by far faster. Yeah. Like it actually is by far faster if everybody's doing it. Right. So it's like, okay, you can have a good orientation toward the zipper method. But then there are some people who have a very bad orientation towards they just want to go up to the front so that they're first so that right. they don't have to wait. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and the people who what happens is that the people like myself who get in, I have to I have to say that if I go ahead and get in right away and then I see people pass by me, my instincts <laughs> that goes off in my head is you are not I'm not letting you in. I'm not letting <laughs> you in. I'm going to get right here. You are yeah. not you are not getting in. Yeah. You know, that's on, I don't know what list because it's been a while since I looked, but on one of the like examination of conscience before confession, mm -hmm. it's, am I a considerate driver? Mm -hmm. Like, do I let other mm -hmm. people in? Do I let people merge and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and when I see people flying up to the front, you know how, like when someone is being a real, like a real, a real dip wad in traffic mm -hmm. and they're flying all over the place and kind of being rude to everyone, they become like inhuman. Like I no longer mm -hmm. see that person as a human being. I see them as like, like the Noid or something from those Domino's mm -hmm, commercials. Mm -hmm, I'm just mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. no, that's no longer like that's what I'm picturing is happening. Is that person's like, I'm going all the way to the front, and I don't care who I make mad. But it turns out that's not what's happening most of the time. From what I understand, the zipper method is a completely legitimate thing, but I think Father's right that approaching it dogmatically, I think. We just need to pick one and just stick with it. That's the rule. And I think the zipper method is probably the better one. So got a lot of meat off of that. So <laughs> got a lot of interesting conversations. From okay. That. So, so speaking of driving down the road, because I think that can, that can bring <laughs> us into the, the topic that I wanted to discuss for, for this month, because yesterday I did a lot of, th this was on my mind because yesterday I did a lot of driving because my wife and kids wanted to go, well, a lot of driving for us, right? So I drove like, I don't know, 30 miles for the whole day. I was going to say. Maybe 40 miles. My, my wife and kids wanted to go to the water park, which is in the hotel that's all the way on the south end of the island. So I had to drive, and they're digging up all the roads here. So it was down to one lane, then two lanes, one lane, two lanes, which is terrible here because people are already bad drivers. But on the way back from picking them up, so I spent a lot of time in the car. On the way back from picking them up, we so so for people who know, I have a seven year old and a four year old. So we're girls. So we're driving and there's like a little I saw them on the way down. They were just standing and like waving the rainbow flags. And now, of course, the transgender flag with the on the island. island. Mm -hmm. But there was only like 30 people, right? 30 people. Mm -hmm. But what was disturbing to me was that I would say probably 20% of the people that were standing there and waving flags were children. And I mean, yeah. young children, like way too young to know what any of that is. And they're just there like with their parents, yeah. uncles, whatever. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> on our way back, they were no longer standing. Now they were starting a little like March, a little procession basically. Right. And so as we pass by, my seven-year-old says, Oh, or I, I said to my wife, it's a real shame that they've got, what bothers me about this is they've got those kids. They shouldn't have those kids waving those flags. That's mm -hmm. what I, that's what I said to my wife. I was like, I would have been like ambivalent about it and been like, yo, you know, whatever, but except for the fact that I saw those kids. Right. And then my daughter, my seven-year-old says, uh, oh, I know what those rainbow flags are. She says rainbow, which we don't, th this is not something that we have brought up with them yet. Right. And my wife and I don't even really, it's not really even a topic that comes up in the house. Uh, she said, but my daughter goes to Catholic school. So this is, there's no Orthodox school here. So she goes to Catholic school. So I'm sure she got it. She's like rainbow flags mean gay and gay is gross. This is what my seven-year-old says. And I said, okay. So for me, I was like, Okay, good enough. There you <laughs> from go. The, from there the mouths of babes. Okay, good, good, good. And then uh, a little ways further, you know, they had a somebody had a sign and it said, you know, pride on it for pride. Because obviously this is a pride month thing for the people who didn't figure that out yet. So pride. And same, she says, pride 
that's also that's for gay. That's gay. And I said, well, right. Is gay. Hold, I said, hold on. Or she was saying like pride stands for gay. And I said, well, hold on. I, was, I said, pride is a sin. I said, so do you know, do you know what pride, do you know what pride is? Like pride is you're not supposed to have, we're not supposed to have pride or we're, we have it, but we're supposed to work against that. I said, do you know what pride is? She didn't know what pride is. And so we said, I said to her, uh, and also my four-year-old is now joining it, right? Because now she's, she's interested in what is this thing that we're talking about, right? So, so I said, pride is when you're thinking only about yourself. It's only about you. You're not thinking about other people. You're thinking all about yourself. And what we want to be is we want to be humble. We want to have humility. Do you know, do you know what being humble is? She said, no. And I said, so simply you could think about it more as like, you're, you're not thinking so much about yourself. Maybe you're thinking more about other people and, and the good of other people. And this is something, and you think less about yourself. Okay. So they start. So we talk about this for a little while and then really providentially when we get home, she, uh, that the kids decided and appropriate for this show, the kids decided that they wanted to watch us. They said, we want to watch a Spider-Man movie. All right. So I go in and I pull down and it's like, okay, Spider-Man, we can watch Spider-Man. Spider-Man three with, with Venom, Sandman. I had never, I had actually never realized I never saw Spider-Man three, but we turn it on. And about 20 minutes in, my daughter goes, this is a good movie for tonight because it's all about pride. When Peter Parker gets the ven gets venom and then he's walking down the street like this, yeah. like talking to all the girls and stuff, he gets the suit, he goes in, you know, and then he's having a aunt conversation with Aunt May, and she said, and my daughter says, I she's she's what did she say? She said, even though she's old, she's really beautiful. I don't see any pride in her. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. That's beautiful. I was yeah. like, wow, yeah. that's like wow. Yeah. And it it was but but it was interesting to me that ultimately, and this was sort of what I wanted to, to talk about as like, because we've, we've hit on it before about, you know, the, the stance of the church on, on gays and all of this sort of situation. But I think more interesting, especially for this month, is the notion that what's happening is it's really the pride, I think. And for my for my kids, to, they don't understand. They, I wasn't going to sit and talk to them about what what break down gay to them. You know, she knows gay is gross, and that's good enough for me, right? But we don't have to have a sexual a, a conversation about sexual matters, right? She's mm -hmm. Seven years old. This is not this okay. is not what we're going to have a conversation about. But pride, we could talk about all day. It's almost like talking with a seven year old about sex is wildly inappropriate. I mean, it's almost mm. like you really shouldn't just do that in general, like. Maybe that might corrupt or warp them in a weird way. So, or have them carry flags, which that would that's really the part that bothers me because I'm like, and and it's it's been helpful for me from like an orthodox. It's been helpful, for, and then I, and and then I'll be quiet about this. But this this is just the part that was has been helpful for me, and that I think is missing from a lot of conversations that I have with people who are otherwise conservative, is that they're very concerned about the fact that it's gay sex that's happening and a lot less concerned about the fact that it's extramarital mm -hmm. well, that's fornication yeah right it, and it's like as coming from somebody who was participating in a, a very wicked sexual world that was heterosexual i mean the destructive the destructive caliber is well, there, that was an no argument who you're used, with. that was an argument they used to make a long time ago i mean a long time ago it's like what a handful like, of years, but it seems like forever, ago. right? Yeah, <laughs> but that argument about um, if you remember that argument they used to make about um, how how would they phrase it? Uh, you know, who are you to lecture us about you know marriage because all of your marriages are fraught with you know adultery and divorce and everything, anyways, too, right? You've heard this argument, you know, um, <clears throat> and it's valid actually. Um, but the, I mean, obviously the problem again is that people get caught up on the wrong thing. And, and I think the problem with this conversation is that like with all these conversations, people will get stuck in like a pothole or they just fixate on one thing and they're not going to hear anything else that we're talking about. Right. So, um, 
I mean, just the, the absolute abomination of homosexuality. Okay, that's right. But there's something even further ahead of that. It's like we didn't tackle, which is essentially, if I'm, if I could kind of um, summarize what you're saying, we didn't really tackle the, those earlier moments of immorality, those earlier moments of of really why sexual morality and these things are, are issues, right? So just the focusing on the spectacle of homosexuality and, and you know, gay, you know, the, the grossness of it, literally the grossness, grotesque, right? In the, in the actual literal sense of the definition, that focus actually I think is maybe part of the, part of the strategy, um, spiritually speaking, demonically speaking, right? Because what it does is it, and for a lot of people, it wears them down to where, you know, you, you wake up one day and you're way over here to the left and you don't even realize what happened just because you're so scandalized at the absurdity of and the spectacle of, you know, yeah, outright open flaunting, you know, homosexuality, lesbians, but now with like trans and the trans wasn't enough. It's like, let, let's, and that's the thing, like getting into the map. Was it map? Like minor attracted yeah, persons. Like the yeah, map that's thing. Which that's, is just a pe- that's, that's a pedophile. That's getting mm-hmm. pushed now, the whole map thing. So the spectacle of that is distracting everyone else. And so we're lo- you know, I think people who are conservative and traditional are really losing ground. I mean, we've lost ground in ways that I mean I even realize because just focusing on the spectacle of that, we're not focusing on, you know, the, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of sex, right? I mean, and this this absence of seeing the what's blessed, I think it has this weird effect where a lot of Orthodoxy and a lot of Orthodox Christians, unfortunately, I just think, get so hung up on in the wrong way they think that orthodoxy is just about maintaining some sort of moral sexual right and and, and purity it's like there's a lot of people like that's their main focus is and and man this is tough because it's just people need to i I know people are going to just like lose their minds but your sexuality I'm, I'm just I'm just speaking about you know a, a Christian or that's Christian who is trying to do their best to be in, in you know the good graces of the church. Your sexuality isn't the fo- should not be the focus of your life. That's part of the problem. Amen. Like, like that's one of the big problems about 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 pornography is that it becomes so all encompassing that. People are so fixated, like, oh, I, I self abuse and this and that. They're missing a whole nother slew of things, including sins of omission, right? They're missing a whole slew of things in regards of like their inability and their unwillingness to really see Christ. Because Christian, we don't have we don't have the market cornered on morality. I mean, other religions talk about that too, right? The the thing is, is if you focus on Christ. And you realize your and work on your love of Christ or your or your lack of love on Christ, those things get worked on. But when that becomes the focus, I think people get trapped in this dichotomy that really distorts the spiritual life. And it becomes to some degree, I mean, this is where some of the Pharisaic movements of people's minds and hearts comes from, because they just get so obsessed about like maintaining purity for the sake of their own purity, not for the out of love of Christ or wanting to, be, to approach Christ. Was that- so let, let me just, let me just tie this back to, cause I, I know I, it seems like I got lost, but let me tie this back because one of the things is that people are now measuring themselves against like the culture. Like you, you can't, we should not measure. Right. Right. Se- relative terms, doing. the relativism. Yeah. Correct. This is mm-hmm. what I'm ultimately trying to get at is we cannot measure ourselves to what the culture is doing and that's what's happened it's like the madness of the culture is so far out this way if you measure yourself by that you're in a world of hurt 
And this is where people's ability to enter into the spirituality of sexuality and their bodies and, and communion, it's just, it's not even on their minds, right? Because they just want to make sure that they're not falling into. So to, to break down what you just said, because mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure I understood it correctly. What you're saying is, is like a proper, like Orthodox Christian who's trying, you know, to do the correct thing, trying to follow Christ as best as they can to measure themselves against some of the depravity that's now mainstream Mm -hmm. is not good enough. Like it, that's not, that's not the true, like, um, that's not the like measuring measure. Yeah. It's not the measure. It's like, um, it's so far out there Mm -hmm. that it's kind of off the map. Pun intended. But what I'm I'm getting at is in a, in a weird twisted way, it, it's not good enough, but, don't interpret that as in the need to get up like crazy puritanical. That's, that's what I'm saying is it's, it's caused people to approach, to approach their lives, their confessional lives, their, their spiritual lives, their inner life in a very puritanical sense. And that's problematic because when you, when you start viewing the faith as just a matter of what you don't do, I don't do this. I don't smoke. Right. I don't, I don't drink. I don't, go with girls who do like when you start, you start ending up very quickly in the same type of spirituality disposition that a lot of Baptists are in like specifically like Baptists. Right. And so the reason why I'm saying this is because the desire, which is a good one to want to be separate from the culture. That's a good one. Right. But we want to be separate from the culture, not just because the culture is disgusting. We want to be separate from the culture because we want to be put pulled apart set aside for God. And so what happens is people begin to operate more about, let me, let me, let me step back. People begin to have a very wrong disposition about who God is and how God views them. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it becomes almost fashionable to look at the kind of draconian, what it could be seemingly become like a draconian approach to things. And then it's like, you begin to enter into this place out of pride. Like you are like, you are holding the line of your own purity, right? It stokes pride in people, right? This is, this is, this is the thing. And so for instance, let me come at this a different way. We were talking about, it was one of the comments, uh, definitely. It was one of the comments on the, um, uh, no, it was one of the comments on uh, the father Peter episode. And someone had like a long thing about, uh, disagreeing about like fasting and self abuse, you know, and just to address that person if they would watch this one. But like, I kind of wanted to put in there, we're like, go like one or two episodes earlier. And, and I was talking about oftentimes lust comes as a direct response to pride. Right. So just to kind of make it clear, it isn't just all about whatever that person thought I was saying. It's about the point with this is, is that these issues around sexuality, they aren't really always just what people think they are. There's, there's more to it than just the gross aspect of like, Oh, I am doing, I'm having quote unquote disordered sex, right? The way that it um, mutilates and distorts the soul and the heart. This is, this is the thing to look at because there's people who, you know, (laughs) you can, have let's say in theory never fallen to like most of the gross sexual sins that the world's fallen into and your heart's black filled with pride sure because of your judgment of those people do you, do you see what i'm saying sure. well this is your, when, when you say it's pharisaical are, you're you're i know you're making it generally but like the publican and the pharisee right so yes. it's like that the Thank pharisee God not like those other people yes, yes because the the publican is focused on god yes and the Pharisee is focused on the publican. Yes. So yes. Okay. Yes. So purity, yes. purity for purity's sake, purity not being a tool, but rather the end itself. Well, it's rea- no, it's reactionary. It's reactionary. So it's like so, so well, it's like, are you facing the altar or are you facing the doors? Looking yeah. at the world outside, saying, Oh, it's so good that yeah. I'm in here. 
yeah. and not out there because look at what's happening out there. And it's like, well, if you're looking out there, you're not facing the altar. Right. I think another way to look at this is kind of thinking about how <clears throat> if someone's struggling with the thoughts, right? Like there's different ways to approach it. There's rebuttal, there's avoidance. But for most people, they can't they can't go the route of rebuttal. It's too much for them. Because as soon as they begin to try to rebut the thought especially if they, if they don't have any guidance with it, they end up just still paying attention to it. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Which yeah. is, which is, which is fine because <clears throat> if you, let's say you're, you're struggling with a logos me around lust, let's just say, right. And logos okay. me doesn't struggle with thoughts. I just had to say it. What's you know, that? For first time listeners, logos me who are unfamiliar with the concept of what logos me is, oh. it's the struggle against thoughts. Yeah, assault of thoughts. Yeah. Like, mere assault of thoughts. So intrusive assault of thoughts. So it's fine if you are like struggling and like, no, 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 no. But there comes a point where if you don't transition out of that, they're fine with you sitting there and staring at them saying, no, 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 no. Because now it's like Cyprian saying, you're no longer focusing on Christ. You are so fixated on avoiding this one thing that you've completely begun to, in, in a weird, in a very odd, twisted way, you kind of like end up turning your, your back on Christ. And this is where people fall into despair. They fall mm -hmm. into despair because they're like, oh, I can never do this. I can never get out of this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's like St. Porfidios. He says, listen, you know, don't struggle. Just open a small aperture of light and just allow the light of Christ to come and to, and to lead you out. And I think that's, I think that's important because, on the one hand, we absolutely need to struggle against this. And I just want to say this isn't about the, you know, the middle road, the Via Medea, which is garbage. We don't, the real path is not the middle road, right? It's Christ, right? So we're coming at a place where it's like we need more hierarchs and clergy to be open about speaking out about this because there's plenty of clergy, I think. Or there's plenty of people who feel like the clergy are, are just kind of indifferent or maybe complicit with it. And that needs to change. Like any any thought that the, the church is kind of like winking at this or like it's okay, but that, that needs to change. That being said, there comes a point where it can't just be about, you know, culture war for the sake of culture war, but like Christ. Because two things. Number one, if we keep the focus on Christ and we say, this is what is important that, that Christ is the one who has liberated us. Christ, if you want to know what it means to be a human being, joy, fulfillment, all those things, you have to look to Christ. Not only will that keep people in the church um, motivated, it'll keep them, you know, within the, within the walls of uh, uh, so they could seek repentance, but also opens the door for people to seek repentance. That that's something that nobody wants to talk about. I, it feels like they're, the doors of repentance should be open to all these people enraptured in this, but how can it be open if we don't really know what we're calling people to repent from? Because it's, it's one thing to get someone to cease a gross sexual sin. It's another thing to get them to pursue chastity or these other things for the love of God. Sure. And that's, and that's the thing that's going to heal people sure. because just getting someone to stop, you know, a quote unquote sexual sin, like the, the behavior of it, that's great, but it's not enough. Cause that's not what, that's not what regenerates someone. Right. It's, it cuts out the cancer and it, and it can stop it from spreading, but in order to regenerate life, we need that you need to go and have them start pursuing their virtues. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I think that's the thing about the pride month is that, you know, the motivation behind all this is, is, and understandably, but it gets so overlooked because it's like this onslaught of spectacle. And it's this, I mean, I was just leaving a certain well-known area in our city here. It's like, I was just there, I don't know, a couple of days ago. It's like overnight, there's rainbow mm -hmm. trans crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And it's like the, the absurdity of it, I, I think, hit me in a new way. Because I wasn't even thinking about like, oh, you know, gays, or whatever. It was like people's like personhood and their humanity is just being subsumed by this. 
And, and I think that's really, I think that's what really hit me today is because people can get caught up in something and God can use that, you know, them being caught up in something to really humble them and to break them down and, and to get them to this place where they want change. But it's something completely different when that very thing that should humble you, you exalt. And I think that's getting back to the pride thing. That's where we're not even, we're not even chipping away at that is what I'm trying to get at. Sure. We're not even chipping away at pride. We're not chipping away at, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be, you know, all these things? We're, we're just so stuck on the spectacle of it, which, again, some people have heard, heard us talk like this and they think it's like a co-signing. It's like, I'm not co-signing anything. It's like I seeing people, like I, I saw this today. I jumped on, you know, every blue moon, I'll jump on and I'll lurk just to see what people are doing, you know. And I saw someone who I'd known for years, like they literally – had a picture of them and their kid there had a picture of their kid with a drag queen. And it was like, we're so excited. Today was the first day, you know, when had a blast with this drag, whatever thing. And it was just, yes, the, the shock of the sexuality and the abomination of that that's all there. But I'm, I'm just thinking about how do you get to this point where, you know, you, you're not even thinking of like a, you're not even like thinking about what that means that you are introducing a child to it, you can't think about it too much because like i think that's when things would start to fall apart and like if i mean not to but that's what pride does and that, i guess that's where you can get into that is because pride is like a fever and one of the fruits of pride not just pride like pride month but like pride in the life of a person, it produces things like, you know, what is delusion? It's, it's a fever. It's like hypocrisy, you know, madness, blindness, mm -hmm. like that's what it produces. And when you see someone full blown into pride, it's, it's scary. Yeah. It's, and it's scary. This, this is, this <laughs> is making me, th when you said it's a fever, what I, what I was thinking as, 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 as I was hear, hearing you, describe this is that the issue it seems to me that the issue is something like or what's 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 happened is well first off there's a lack of love because the question is like well why do you why do you need first it was like pride week i think maybe it was pride day who knows it was like a then, pride day I then, it, was pride, pride then day. it was pride week yeah, and now it's a Pride Month, and I feel like last year it even extended into July. It did. Oh, Maybe it, it was like Pride multiple months, and so it was like. But then the question arises, like, well, and and everybody's like, we need this, we need this, right from their side. We need this, we need this. You have to celebrate this. We need you to do this. You must do this. You must do this. And the thing with the kids walking with the flags, and it's like, wait, why? What is it that this is solving? Like, what is what? Why is it needed? And like, the answer must be because there's a recognition that we are unhappy. We are unfulfilled. Thus, we need to have this month of where we celebrate ourselves and convince ourselves that, no, we're not unhappy. We actually no. are happy. <laughs> I, I maybe, maybe. Okay, mm. one thing I want to say really quick, and I won't talk very long, Go ahead. but Pride, speaking of Spider-Man, get back really real quick. Pride was the thing that led uh, Peter to let the robber go by, and who ended up killing Ben, uh, who ended up killing Uncle Ben. So I mean, like, yes, that's I, right. And then he's a prideful about, person. He's a Peter Parker is a prideful guy. Yeah, naturally, but he obviously struggles against it very, very hard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then talk about God using, you know, in Marvel mm -hmm. comics, mm -hmm. God using. Peter's guilt as a way to keep moving forward to keep, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So we can talk about that some other time. I actually think it's different the way I see it, Cyprian. And I'm not saying that you're, mm, what you're saying ahead. is wrong because I think that's something, but what I think it is, is I think for a lot of people, it's a, like a quote unquote explanation to their unhappiness and like about their unhappiness. And I think that like, when you met someone, as I'm sure we all have, who is constantly like needing to tell themselves the thing that's sustaining them over and over and over again, I like this. I want to be doing this. I want to be doing this, even though like their conscience can be like on fire. 
because there was this online like therapy commercial or something on YouTube. And there's this woman who's walking around and it just keeps showing her like on the phone and she's talking to herself and she's like, and one of them, she's like, oh my gosh, I think I'm gay. And like, and like, oh, that's been the problem the entire time. All this uncomfort, all these like negative feelings about myself, all this like inner despair, it's all because I'm gay and I won't recognize it. So I mean, I know because I'm working in the field, but that's one of the first things that you're kind of supposed to ask a person is like, well, do you think that you might be gay and that's why you're unhappy? Like, do you think that like the inner turmoil and like, not to mention, I mean, even in the big book, like it talks about people who find out in their quote unquote in their recovery that they're gay. Well, there's All a point like. But, no, I, I think I think that's I think that's wrong. And I think that is exactly like father said that it's about a fever because the fever isn't the sickness. The fever is the body's response right. to the sickness. Right. right. So it's like when somebody says, oh, I think I'm gay. That's the fever. Right. That's not what's making them unhappy. No, because of course. the one thing that you see is when those people are like, oh, I'm gay or they decide they're going to chop off body parts because now right. it's I'm trans. Right. They're less happy because well, it okay. wasn't the thing in the first place. Right. Of well, course. the thing is, is like, no, sorry, father, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, there's there's all these presuppositions, which is my whole diatribe a couple minutes ago. That's one of the points I was trying to like I failed at getting across is that there's these presuppositions that we aren't even looking at anymore. Like we're, we're operating on their terms. Yeah. We are operating on a presupposition like, Oh, well, maybe you are gay or maybe there, you know, you see what I'm saying? There's these presuppositions of just of certain things that are lies. Being gay is a thing. That's it. That, I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to say, but that's how far, that's how far we are like to the left in regards to conversation, meaning conservative traditional people is that we are we've been we are slowly being ground down to where we don't even realize that in some ways we're we're conceding ground like not like look very few people talking with their sister their cousin their buddy whatever and like hey this and this and that you know i'm coming out i'm i'm going to have you know i'm going to start taking hormones or i'm going to give my kid hormones how many people even go like well even come to the point where it's like well what do you mean like that's not even a thing being gay. I know. And no one thinks that anymore. We're so far to the left on this that it's a it's a standing unsaid presupposition that will maybe okay, yeah, maybe you are that, but still don't do that. Do you see yeah. do you see that? Maybe you are that, yeah. but don't go so far to like do this, do that. Do you see what I'm saying? That's that yeah. kind that's what I mean by that concession. That's what I mean by it's brought us to this place where the, the the real thing we can't even address anymore. We're so busy playing whack-a-mole with all of the uh all the all the spectacle that yeah. you'll and, and each do. one and each one is different, right? So it's like even though the core foundational discomfort is the same, you got to deal with the tra person who says they're trans different than the person who says they're non-binary I mean, different than the person who says they're gay different than you know. That's that's a question that you can ask. I mean, it's just like, well, are we talking about gay or are we talking about same sex attraction? Because right. those are two separate things. And, like, or even like like uh, gender dysmorphia, body dysmorphia. That's not even a thing anymore. Yeah, right? yeah. So, mm -mm. like, that's that's what. I how mean. about just confusion? Because because like, how about how about just being confused and you don't know what's wrong. Like, is that a thing? Because, like, that's an actual thing. Like, we wouldn't think, you know, we they have what's called, like, I think they call them, like, um, transient symptoms or something like that, where you'll, like, have something wrong with you, and you don't know what's wrong with you, but you'll be like, you know, from time to time I feel tired like this or whatever, and you'll go in and they'll give you a, bu a battery of tests, sure. and they may still not even figure it out, and they may think that it's one thing to start with, and then something else. And it's like, could you imagine if all of us just walked around and it's like, oh, you know, I've been feeling listless and tired. And then we watch a few YouTube videos and then we say, oh, you know what? I've got anemia. 
And then sure. I could just walk to a pharmacy and the pharmacist will just <laughs> give and me drugs. Anybody, for and <laughs> anybody who contradicts your anemia, like then that person's some kind of bigot. And well, that's, like, the, that's the thing about pride, right? Is that you automatically know. It can't right. be corrected. You're an expert and no one can say anything else to you. How can you tell me about my <clears throat> sexuality? And but that's How can the you thing? tell me I about tell what everybody, my gender? It's like, that's the problem with the identity politics in the first place is like, I'm the last person you want to talk to about who I am. I don't know who I am a lot of the times. Like, I think I do, but I could say, oh, yeah, I'm I'm a pretty clean person. You know, I'm pretty Let's organized. See. And then you go talk to my wife. She's like, no, he's not a clean and organized person. What he's happens, the exact opposite. What's happened to people, too, is that the culture influences let me let me try to slow this down because I, I want to get this point. The culture, in the broader sense, like Western American culture, right? It's begun to influence people in the church in ways that like people don't even realize. It's imperceptible because of this very thing that we're talking about. Because take for instance, right? Like let's just talk about pride. Like if we can. I think this is kind of an even an interesting thing is like separating, like let's just talk about pride in the sense of the passion right now, right? And later we can talk about the way that it's you it uniquely has kind of like manifested with you know the um LGBTQIA community, whatever, right? Alphabet soup. The thing about pride is that pride has always been a problem, it's always the problem. But I suspect, I mean, I, I can only say, you know, I've only lived in the time that I've lived and the body that I've lived and the culture that I've lived. But I suspect it's never been more difficult to wake someone out of the fever of delusion and pride as it is now. Absolutely. Because the very nature of our culture right now whispers to us imperceptibly all those self-affirming things that just, this is my truth. Like, let me give you an example. I, I, I've, I've dealt with people who they read, you know, they pick up a book, they read a book, and then all of a sudden they want to now expound on why certain experiences that they're having is this and that. And, it's a, it's a perfectly valid thing. And I'm like, okay, this is delusion, right? Like you're talking about these movements in your body and this and this and that, but like you're a terrible husband, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're in delusion, right? Yeah. But you can't say that to people because, right? They don't realize how not even just for them, but the way the culture has set everyone up to say like the, the subjective nature of reality. Now people are sure. so divorced from community. Like this is why the community aspect of orthodoxy is so important. And I, I think this is one of those little gems. I think that might be hidden in this episode. I think this is one of the reasons why the question of orthodoxy on the internet or, or actually internet orthodoxy, whatever, is actually a really important topic because if you don't have the incarnational aspect of being in a community, it this issue of being an island unto yourself just it's I mean it just explodes. Your right? iron goes very dull. It doesn't. We not already control. have a problem. Like people living in a community, having a wife, having kids, having brothers and sisters. It's already tough for us just because of how weak and how deluded our, our generations are, right? But then you add on to that people's inability to receive correction, people's inability to, to live what I would call like an authentic life, meaning that they live in a life of, of community with people that allows for them to be, you know, to be frank, exposed. What I mean by exposed, I don't mean your sins per se, but I mean, Hey, I'm, I'm in trouble. I need help. Can you come help me? Like back in the day, if you needed help and 
you you needed help like with your farm or like some kind of tangible work your neighbor coming and helping you was a very real way for them to know you is does this make sense because yeah. it's it takes yes. out the pretense of of that interaction it's like you're sweating i'm sweating i'm worried about this this barn isn't going to get raised in time for my feed or you see what i'm saying that's in fact, great... are they even are they even your neighbor if they don't come and help? That's the question. Like, See, it's are you even being neighborly? Do you right. have the likeness of a neighbor? Right. And this is so important because I have found just being in both sides of the fence that it is very hard to really take in what the church is teaching us about things like humility, love, you know, nobility, philotomo. It's very hard. to. It's almost impossible to take those in if you are living in a kind of bubble of ideas and ideology and this this obsession with moral purity. Because here's the thing. This is the big problem with like self abuseless things is that it's fundamentally so egocentric. Right. So it's like everything we need to do, everything that everything that we need to do to get out of this is found in those real simple basic things of being in community and I, and I mean helping neighbors like man helping people move like that's a real tangible way of getting to know your neighbor picking like, somebody up from the airport dropping them off some, picking someone yep. up from the airport you know what I mean like bringing them a meal if their wife is sick I know that sounds real cheesy or whatever but I'm telling you we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about like the mundane things, like that's how you enter into the, the spiritual life. If you're in a parish, that's the way you do it is you by those mundane things of taking care of your brothers and sisters. Like that's the way it happens. And pride keeps you from that. Pride keeps you from asking. Like that's another thing that we don't want to talk about. Pride keeps you from saying like, hey, you know what? I need help. Then this is what I'm trying to get at. It isn't so yes. much about you. It isn't so much about the person not volunteering. It's about the person not asking. Yeah. Right. That's Peter. That That's Peter, right? Lord, you'll never wash my, wash my uh, feet. That's pride. That's so much pride. That's pride. Right. And so mm -hmm. under understanding that and understanding because what God is community, right? Trinity, the Holy Trinity, that's what, that's what and who God is, right? And it's not a monad. Ooh. You see what I'm saying? So any movement to get out of that, it is demonic fundamentally. And that's why, like with Pride Month and all these things, it's like we all know what it is. What I'm trying to say is I'm not saying we need to let go of the grossness of like what's happening. I'm saying we should go even deeper because, okay, let's hear, here's the scenario. You're at a Thanksgiving dinner, right? And your, your gay trans cousin Libby is coming, right? And you know that Libby, because your aunt told her, hey, or your aunt told you, her mom said, hey, you know, Libby's really, she knows you're a Christian, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know that there's a little showdown coming, right? Well, you're not like you could lose the battle because you're going to sit and get in a uh, a debate about the kind of like gross nature of homosexual acts and pedophilia, which, of course. Right. But the thing that's actually going to cut your cousin Libby to the heart is some of what we're talking about. Right. Like, where did this come from? And like what? Like. Why are you? Even, why are you so unhappy? Why are you so unhappy? Like, where do? Yeah. why do you think that this is? going to bring you something right we don't even we don't even get past that because we're on the defensive and maybe that's another way of looking at it we're so on and the we've defensive. also forgive me father we've by doing by doing the former you've also dehumanized your cousin because right. you're no longer you no longer care about her right. you only you only are viewing her now as an exemplar of well some she's an enemy concept. she's an enemy yes, right. she's, well, a she's she's a contagion she's an enemy and the, like, the one who's going to bring the leprosy to you and your family and like your kids. And I get that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, Hey, let it, uh, please hear me on that. Cause I get that. What I'm trying to get at is maybe this is another way to spin it for people. We need to work on not being on the defensive. And I think that just 
trying to like, okay, look, build your build your arc, right? Build your arc, preserve your family, preserve the kids, right? That's what we've done here. Okay, great. But then once you built the arc, go on attack. Look at it that way, right? But the attack isn't, hey, this is gross and what you're doing is like whatever. Like, that's fine. Like, go even deeper because that's where that's where they're not getting hit anymore. They're not getting hit on the, on the matter of the heart. Everything is about the external of it, right? Which is terrible and it's tragic and it's disgusting. That's great. But getting to the, getting on the offensive and going to the heart. And like I said, even getting to some of those issues that like maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we could have talked about and been like, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling me that like, you're saying something like this is a matter of fact. Well, why is this a matter of fact? This presupposition that you're like, I don't see that. You know what I mean? I mean that, and that, I think that's like kind of like the inversion of the community, right? Because like you could definitely could make the argument, well, the alphabet soup people have formed their own community, but, but that's a community based on your own, like you're, you happen to like the same things. Like you happen to like the same things and like you almost like it's, you only like these people because kind of like they're an extension of yourself. Like, <laughs> but there is less of a community. There is less of a gay community now than there ever has been. Well, in the, he, in the same way that that's true for every other type of subculture or community. Well, I think, and I, I think, I think the thing is, for you, I think the thing is, I want to kind of pull this out is it's like, uh, we had this, I saw this recently, like there was the one guy who, um, I can't remember who he was, but he kind of came out and he wrote this whole thing about Jay Dyer or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Mm. It was just interesting to me because I've seen this before where he was, you know, on Jay's discord and like really in there, kind of in the inner circle and got slighted, I guess. That seems like the mm-hmm, narrative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he's all the way on the other side. Now the pendulum swing. Mm. So now he's like an ecumenist and like all this, all this other stuff. The reason why I'm saying that is because you see that you see where someone it this is what I'm trying to get at. It's their heart. They just trade in whatever external for the thing. It's like, you know, here I am in this youth group and now here I am over here. Like basically, you know, the trans, whatever thing is my new youth group, whatever. Like mm-hmm. the problem was the whole time is like your, the orientation of your heart. Was it right in the first place? Sure. Like, the youth pastor guy, he was just stoked that you were excited and wanted to do all this stuff, but he wasn't really looking to be like, well, like, how are you meeting Christ and how are you like growing right. and like, repenting, right? right? It's like, cool. Here's one person who wants to go on missions trips. Well, when the flatness of that wears off, it's like you're that person, the issue with their heart hasn't changed. So yeah. they're just going to go find another group to do the same thing with. But at the same surface level. At it's the, the same, same surface so, level. So, so they'll just be like, that. change the uniform. They'll be like, oh, yeah. the real problem, the real problem right. was the uniform that I was wearing right. wasn't the right uniform. Right. It wasn't that you were playing the completely right. wrong game in the first right. place. And this is so important because what we've talked about, which like Sons of Peterson and stuff like that, is like, that's mm-hmm. again getting at the heart of it. That's you know, it. Pun mm-hmm. intended is that mm-hmm. if you just address the things that you find uncomfortable, like let's just go down the line. Like people are like, okay, like the orthodox monster, like, you know, the 25 year old single white male who now is angry, wants to rage and he's using the church. Okay. Like, that's fine. If you want to like make that a whole thing, but instead of just like characterizing that person and just saying like, which is this is what a lot of people are doing this is why they're worried about quote unquote internet orthodoxy. It's like, why is that guy searching for what he's searching for in the church? Where is his heart? That's how you, this is getting back to being fisher of men, like make the catch clean. And what is really going on in there? Right. We can go down the line. It's like the bleeding heart liberal who just thinks that like orthodoxy is not the standard, uh, you know, American evangelical, you know, white supremacist uh, Christianity. And this is the place where justice can be found. It's like, OK, great. Well, that's not necessarily the case. But like, where is your heart? Because if you don't get the heart on whether it's like. Both of those people can are are on the verge of being radicalized because they're missing Christ, right? Yeah. 
if you if you get to the heart of it, then there, you don't have to worry about the pendulum swings of them just switching costumes. Sure. Because right? that's yeah. ultimately the thing is like, how do we get people to where they're actually converted? Because I think that's the thing is people, don't, you know, we use the word conversion a lot and like we talk about converts, but like, I think really what you're talking about are people who have just come in and join the institution of the church, but they yep. haven't, they haven't gotten in, grafted into the organism of the church. But yeah. it is about pride, isn't it, Father? Because it's like when you say that was so that 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 really hit me when you said that the issue with pride and it's so true and so self evident It's like a, a like a duh uh, factor is when you're like the issue with pride is that you won't ask for help. Like the issue, that's the big issue with pride is it? And so I, I can't so many times in my life where I've heard some tragic story from somebody who I care about and they're telling me this tragic story. And I'm like, dude, why didn't you call me? Yeah. Like I would. Are you kidding? We could have solved this. Like we could have none of this would have happened. Why didn't you just pick up? Oh man, you know, I thought I could like I was sure I could handle it. I didn't want to bother you. I wouldn't want didn't want to do all of this sort of and it's like I think that the where where the the people who are going to have an issue where they're going to become that archetype that where people are looking and like here's the problem with internet orthodoxy is because they're they're coming in not to be healed. Yeah. Like yeah. That's the whole. It's like, wait, how they do want... you, how do you come to Christ without the the intention of being healed? Like, have you not read a gospel? Well, yeah, there's. You know this... what I mean? Like, yeah. What... yeah. Do well, you guys know? To... Uh, well, do you know Frank Peretti, the writer? Oh, Frankie Peretti with like the um, what is it? The darkest piercing in the darkness. Yeah. And... yeah, yeah. So I don't know much about those books. I never read them, but something that um, I think one of my family members was really into him or something. They talked about how people really, on some extent, really in that book, something like a monster is like a dragon or something like that, and they're all like the dragon represents sin, and they love the dragon. They're sitting there like stoking the dragon. Like I, I am coming up into a, a lot where I'm butting heads with people who really, really like their pride. They really, really like the things like, I don't know, it just, it manifests in such a way and it's it's very specific with my generation. And so I can only really speak to that, but the people who need to know the most about the thing that they're into, Mm -hmm. if they're really, really into like music, then they got to know everything about music. They got to know everything about that genre of music. And you can't, you can't possibly get one over on them. You can't know a band. And even well, you that's, can- the, that's the identity thing. And that's where, I mean, it's tough because I mean, I just know this from being guilty of it myself, where it's like, it, you see how pride robs you of love, like the love of the music. Cause it's not even yeah, about the music. It's not even it's about fun my anymore. identity and being able for someone to be like, I know better and I'm secure and this and that. And like the insecurity that pe- I mean, that is such a huge problem because the insecurity is the way that prize developed. I mean, I've talked about this before, but if you, if you think about it like this, like people don't wake up and want and say, I want to be proud. You know what I mean? Sure. They have something that it's like, um, it's like a callus, you know, there's this thing that's irritating something and then the callus develops as a response to that irritation. Is, so the pride is like, and now the, the callus is analogous to the pride. And so it, it develops. And then what happens is that it, and it, it has a certain measure of use because all passions need to be inverted. Right. So, there's a certain level where it is functional in regards of, you know, confidence and, you know, awareness. Right. But that line is so thin and very quickly the callus no longer serves its purpose. And then it becomes this huge thing to where now the callus is a bigger problem than than the initial irritation. Right. And so this is where people get stuck in pride and it, and it's tough because their whole lives then become sometimes about, constantly defending and justifying themselves on every level and, and the callus so gets bigger every time they the do the callus gets it bigger gets stronger so yeah. it's never, it's that's why that's why you don't ever see like when someone's full blown it, it's very rarely do you see someone who's so caught up 
with identity and things like that, it isn't just about like this one area. Mm -hmm. You can talk to them about no, anything. Every, it'll be everything. It's ever. everything. They're super yeah. opinionated about everything, and, and they're the best. And they're the best at everything. They're the best at it. And but it doesn't that's, matter what you bring that's up. something <laughs> I was trying to get to earlier. Is that whole like that that needing to be like okay, I'm gay, right? Well, like if the the path to salvation, there's these constant like roots off that led in these mm -hmm. lead into these dead ends. That is a surefire dead end that's like mm -hmm. overpopulated and camped out and completely filled up with people right now because then your whole life, which is one of the problems with having this as your sexual identity, is like if you can name five things that you know about yourself that you consider as part of your identity. So for Andrew, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm a male. I'm American. Blah, blah, blah. But if your sexual identity is in the top five immediately you recognize the huge amount of like disorder you have in your life and you can feel it mm -hmm. and the whole rest of your life is spent defending that stance so like the because well, you can never be gay enough well this okay, is this is sure this, if but you like, can never be gay enough you always have to be this, which is why you go from a day to a week to a month to <laughs> so this is the problem i have with some of the people i love dearly who are quote unquote gay who are who have incorporated this into as part of their identity is everything it's is suddenly it. gay suddenly their wallpaper on their phone is a rainbow every bit of clothing that they buy is a mm -hmm. rainbow everything that they stand for had they have to work something about being gay well as a lesbian i say this right it's like i never say well i should more than i do but i never say as an orthodox christian See, i say this it's, it's, but it's, like hold on i'm so sorry father just let please. me get to the end of this thought if I didn't just lose it, which I might have, <laughs> I think I might have just lost it. Sorry, Andrew. but um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's, oh man, that was good too. It's okay. That's all right. That's all right. No, we, Let Andrew, we were talking about never being gay enough. Everything they buy is a. They've got it the as their identity. Their Everything they and, buy for their clothes on their phone. It has a and, like oh yeah, that's good. what I was yeah, gonna yeah, say. Good, good, this good. is the last thing I'll say, and it is fueled because the problem is, is when it challenged that fury that you see when it's challenged, when it comes out, this is, I'll have a quick antidote. I went to a, a good buddy of mine's birthday. He had a Catholic friend who was there and we were talking, one of his Catholic friends or one of his friends. So my friend's friend's friend, right? Is this a Hadith? Is this a <laughs> <laughs> no. Did he know Muhammad? He told, he, know me, Muhammad? <laughs> he told me gambling is totally cool. He told me that don't worry about gambling. It's totally cool. But no, he basically as it is at a popular school here in Missouri, in Kansas City area, in the Kansas City metro area, and um basically was in class and the queer alliance came in. And basically was giving a presentation and basically at the end of it said something like, if anyone disagrees with what we're saying, go ahead and, you know, you can say something. And the dude stood up because he's Catholic. He stood up and he was like, yeah, I don't agree. Like, even on a fundamental, like, materialist perspective, there's really no reason, at least that he's presenting, that, that this would exist. Why would evolution allow this to be? Mm -hmm. Like, the, it, it takes away from the one thing about life is this that procreate life. You create more life. That's the thing. And so, like, why would it allow, a, you know, a different sexual orientation in its in its creation or whatever blah 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 and he said that like he's now they're talking about not graduating him yep. like they're talking about like he's not going to get graduated and he said that like the demonic fury when he was looking around the room and presenting oh, his case they would have killed him that, if they could have oh well, yeah dude, that, he was like because it was, it was like, a setup that's see, well, see, and th this but is, this the is... last thing. Hold on, Cyprian. Go I'm ahead. so sorry. I'm yes, being please. I'm being uh, assertive, but I'm sorry. This is Go the ahead. last thing. Is he said? Um. Oh man, this is this night. Uh, they were he, they were not going to graduate him. They were not going to graduate. Oh, sorry, Andrew. For so no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. And he said, and then the professor said, "Well, don't. I, it's okay because I don't even believe in natural law." which means I don't believe that good and evil exist at all. And then I was like, so you're a nihilist. Thank you for being honest, because that's all I'm looking for. At least you are open and honest about who you are, as, 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 as opposed to couching it behind terms of like, I'm doing this for the good of humanity. I'm doing this to make us a better people, to work towards that utopia we've been working towards for so long. I'm trying to get us there. You're not couching it in terms of that. You're just being honest 
I don't believe in anything. I'm like, that, that's I, another I, side. That's another side of what I was trying to get at too. Of like, that's exact. That's one point exactly. What I'm trying to say is like getting people like to that point, calling that out. Like that is the kind of uh, bullseye getting to the heart of it that I'm talking about. Instead of being caught up and like all like the outrage and everything get to that point, because that type of exposure is what needs to happen. Like, here's why, because somewhere in there, right. Someone's exposed to this exchange, which is getting is like, which is actually exposing something. They maybe could have a seed planted of like, hold on here. Like they're out, I'm outraged. Yeah. This guy's a bigot. This guy's a bigot. The teacher said, hold on. What? You don't mm -hmm. believe in good and evil. Oh, mm -hmm. and then like they're having a hot dog, you know, three days later, and they're like, so that teacher could probably just like murder someone and not even like, you see what I'm saying? That type of like process because we just celebrated Pentecost. Right. And so Surprise, surprise, the Holy Spirit is poured out and still working like on everyone, right? And so there are people still that can get that nudge to be like, hey, have you thought about this? Hey, right? And that's what happened with a lot of people in 20 and 21 when they saw the evil that opened them up to something and then just little thing nudged them and it's like what the Holy Spirit just nudges them. And the next thing you know, they're like traveling down the road of quote unquote orthodoxy on the internet. But that's a real thing. But it only happens if you get to the core, if you expose and get to the core of some of these things. If you just stay on the superficial level, the outrage of like the obvious- the flesh and blood. If you stay at the flesh, flesh and, blood, and blood and you don't get to the principalities and it. powers. That's it. You're not, you're not actually engaging in the warfare. Right? And, and this is, and it's a huge- I mean, this is, I've been telling people, like I've been saying for a couple of years, I've been like, their degeneracy is your trap for these exact yep. reasons. Because you're going to, like, yes. But the problem is, Supreme, when people hear that, and I think that's, I, hopefully this, it won't be, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully this would be one of those moments where people who've kind of like felt we're on the fence on that, they can hear like, no. Because when people hear us say that, they think that like, there's some weird softness we have toward the no, degeneracy. No, it's not not at all. It's, it's not, not soft at, all, at all. I'm talking principalities and powers. Yes. The degeneracy is flesh and blood. I'm like, for me, I'm like, the degeneracy is like you are you are wasting all your energy and the yes. dude is wearing you down yes. to where when it really matters, you won't you won't have anything left. It's a you rope a dope. It's, it's, a they're, they're, it's a rope a dope. It's they're a rope-a-dope. Just, they're Muhammad Ali like this. Yep. You're George Fraser swinging yep. at their gloves. Rope but the thing is, there's there's no, especially and 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 I and especially if you're gonna do this with the trans community like drag queens, you got to understand like they're that that form of what they're doing is built as like a sponge for ridicule. Right. It's a, it's a, it's clown, it's that a way. clown show. Yeah. It's a design listen, that way. listen to the names that they give themselves. It's like it's meant to be an absurd clown show yeah. where you throw your ridicule and they like build it up like this and then throw it back at you in this way. Right. And it's like, yo, what what are you? That's what they want you to yeah. do. It's yeah. wrestling. It's professional. It's wrestling. Re it's, wrestling. it's kayfabe. Yeah. It's and exactly the thing that people kayfabe. Are, and the yes. thing that people are missing is that. Like, I'm not wrestling with the culture in that sense. I mean, what needs to happen is, like, in my mind, someone seeing you handle that as Christ would, that's evangelism. When someone sees, like, whoa, 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 mm. whoa, whoa, what just happened there? That's evangelism. Because people, when you get into the, when you get into the flesh and blood, like, you become part of the spectacle. You become... Yep. The, it's this weird inversion where you now they make you into the antagonist if that makes sense you're the you're like, the foil you're the you're the you're the, he, they you're the heckler you the, they you you're the, the heckler that the comedian then uses yeah. as his entire act that he goes yeah. back and forth with you and he roasts you and that's what people i think on the conservative traditional side they really miss that mm -hmm. it's like that's that's the real problem right but if you if you realize what you're dealing with, not flesh and blood, right? And you, and you start mm -hmm. looking for accuracy. 
I think what the fruit of that is people see that and then it makes it, it, it opens up, opens them up now to start looking because I think that's what's happened. I think a lot of the people who have come into the church through the internet, that's what's happened. They caught a glimpse of something that wasn't mm-hmm. so much the outrage, but something more dignified, more pure. So, you know what I'm saying? Something caught them, something true, something beautiful caught them. And they're like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. I never, I never considered that. Right. And then that leads them down the path. But if you're just caught in the spectacle, it's like, but they have to get into a parish. You have to get into a parish. Father, and father, father I want to, I want to tell you guys this story because it's so interesting. I had had, and it, it was, it's been, it's been actually edifying for me. Um, like it's edifying for, I, I, I feel like there it's, it's a huge blessing that I'm being, actually presented in the flesh with young men in their 20s who are recent converts who I'm able to have close relationships with who are coming here which is incredible who are you know converts to orthodoxy but as I was telling you brother in Christ who I who is an engineer we're working together on a project he came to Saipan he's from Germany he's a recent convert of like the last year um and he was here, and so he was with the brothers who were here after we had our typica, and we're sitting and we're having like our agape meal and talking. And one of the things that that we were talking about that was so interesting, and that and we were talking about their generation, you know, like twenty five years old. And he had brought up, and I was like, "Whoa, I never even thought about this." He was because we were talking about this idea of of age stratification and cohorts. Because mm. I was talking about you know that there used to ju- just be kid stuff and adult stuff. Mm. And now there's like all these various levels of kids stuff, like young and then teen and a young adult and blah, 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 blah. And then there's like various different even age stratification for adults. Right. And he was saying he was like, you know, before I was in my parish, I really only hung out with my cohort. And he was like, and it wasn't even just a cohort by age, but he was like, it was even a cohort by like marital status. Mm-hmm. Because if one of the people in that cohort would get married or have kids, we would no, they would no longer be in the cohort. And he was like, but once I got into my parish, now there's like from, you know, 70 to newborn mm-hmm. and all of these families. And, and it occurred to me where I was like, oh, yeah. In a society where we no longer have these huge extended families that we would be around all the time with cousins and everything like that, which is interesting because the brothers who are here, they come from a big Mexican family. One of the things when they talk about their childhood was like every Sunday there would be like, I don't know, dozens of their family members. They were raised with their cousins, were their best friends, and, and which is typical like Mexican family. And they would go back to the to the village, you know, where all their family was from and same sort of situation. And it's like, Okay, then you see all of these examples. But, you know, speaking to like a modern 25 year old German, it was this example of like, I never got to see parents parent besides my own parents, like in an intimate setting, you know, especially young parents. And it was just like even that thought. And it's like, how would you even learn? See, that's that vulnerability I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like that exposure I was talking about. I think one of the things, one of the common things that happens a lot when you enter a community is, and I've certainly have been guilty of it, is feeling left out. Like there are people you find out later that like maybe there's a birthday party for someone and you weren't invited or like that there was a certain like get together and, you know, you only heard about it through someone else or something like that. Um, But I think like, I think that's just part of being a community. And I just don't think we have any gauge for that. I think like as I because I'm definitely part of a community, like I have helped people move. People have helped me move. I go to their birthday parties and their kids and our kids play together and everything like that. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's like we actually were at our um, farm, the church farm, and we were sitting around talking the dude that's in charge of the farm was giving a presentation and kind of talking about its integration with the school kids were running around and laughing and father like leaned over me. He's like, this is paradise. Like, this is paradise. Like we're in a garden with everyone we love, you know, everyone, our church, our family in Christ. And it's beautiful and wonderful. But like part of the community is like having to learn like, like, well, boundaries first off, like, you know, who, who is okay with you, you know, saying something to their kids and who is not like, who's okay with like, um, 
talking about this thing and who's not who who wants to hang out and who doesn't who's down to for people to come over to their house and who's not and like all of that stuff is very uncomfortable like but it's good it's it's a good thing you're you, it's iron sharpening iron like i'm literally becoming a better more considerate person because i have said the stupid insensitive thing before i have cracked a joke about something and little that i know later on that that person experienced that thing or something like that you know what i mean and but like that is so far removed because any type of rejection by especially like by my generation just causes us to just swirl up into like and retreat to the internet and tweet to everybody about how we just got rejected by this person and then everyone comes in and it's like it's not your pride. fault it's that's not that's your pride. fault that's pride and that's pride and that's that's pride and it, and it's also another one of the ways that that pride is facilitated is like this this is one of the big problems like identity and identitarianism is that the kind of manicured context just being around people like yourself like that safe context like that's why a parish is so necessary because a healthy parish is going to have this really good balance of everyone being of the same spirit which should be moving towards christ but at different paces and at different levels yeah. you need to have that you need you need to have that for in order to be healthy and the identitarian thing you know that's where people just want to have like the bubble and that's where you know the kind of an inbred mentality and spirituality becomes inbred that's a really really and, good and you, term. and you can't learn mercy you can't learn no. mercy inside the bubble there's and, and it's not even learning mercy you can't <sighs> practice mercy which is a problem to take yourself to take yourself away from that humility and mercy you can't you're, you're you can't practice it inside a bubble where everybody thinks exactly alike yeah, you know yeah. not only is it a matter of not giving it but you can't receive it which is more important because i've had people <laughs> i've had people it's weird speaking of pride i've had people come to me and they're like you know blah 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 whatever and they're they're making a confession not like a confession confession but like they're opening up to me like, I'm sorry, I judged you. I wasn't being merciful to you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, God bless you, you know? But the thing is, is like, <laughs> there's, there's still pride in that. You know what I mean? Because it's like, I didn't, you know, because because what, what they're saying there is like, I'm, I need to be merciful because I'm correct. And I wasn't leaving you. The oh, I need to be incorrect. I you know oh. what I mean? So, I, oh, I it's see like that a... sometimes. That's why I'm saying it's not really even about you extending mercy. It's about you learning to receive mercy. You know what I'm saying? Because like, that's, that's a huge thing. And that's what happens in a family, in a community is that you learn to, you, you recognize the need for mercy towards yourself. I think, and that's, that's the thing. That's how you can kind of avoid another trap of pride. You know, it's like, and that's why I like, forgive me. You know, like that statement, forgive me, is a good, it's a good word to have on your lips often, you know. that And that can only happen with conflict born out of a, a mutual seeking of truth mm -hmm. or a mutual seeking of Christ. Like it goes mm -hmm. back to Andrew's thing of, you know, the, the queer alliance or whatever coming in and saying at the end, oh, well, if anybody disagrees, stand up. But again, it's like it's a trap. It wasn't in a it wasn't seeking truth. It wasn't saying, hey, there's a chance that we're wrong here. Stand up so and we would dares. like to hear your yeah, opinion. Sorry, you know? That's why I know dares. you are. So I can yeah. take you out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like stand up, stand up now so we can figure out who the enemies are. Yeah. Right? Who needs to be eliminated? Go ahead and 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 raise your hand so that we can take you outside and, and uh, execute you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's yeah. that's one of the things too, is that like kind of getting back to an earlier thing of <clears throat> like sexual morality should be the fruit of something, not the, not the kind of like focus, you know what I'm saying? It, sh it should be the fruit of something because when people are caught up in such a way that like, they're going to guard their purity at all costs, you're not looking for accountability. You're not looking to be subject to what the community says is, you know, blessed. And and that's another portion of like confession in the sense sacramental confession of like what the job of the priest is, is because 
the priest is reconciling you back to the church, right? It's like, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, if you had leprosy, you had to present yourself to the priest to see if you were clean or not, right? It's just like in the Gospels when the Lord cleared, healed the leper, he said, okay, go present yourself to the priest now, right? Because there's a reconciling back to the community. It isn't just about, it's the cross, right? It isn't just about the vertical of you and God. And that's what that's a problem that a lot of Protestants struggle with when they become into the church is, you know, again, this is what I'm, I feel like, I know it feels like I'm hammering this, but I just want people to understand. It's like, if you really get what I'm saying here about your emphasis on like, yes, struggle with your sexual sin, absolutely struggle and like ask God for help, but understand why you're struggling, right? Because it isn't just about you and you being morally pure in of yourself, right? There's a whole community aspect to it you see what i'm saying and if you are so entrenched and narcissistic and self-loving which is the fruit of your sexual sin right not the cause right it's the fruit of it like then you begin to understand like oh like this isn't just even about like me and god it's also like my sin is hurting my brother and my sister you know what i mean like i don't even recognize it as such but it is and that's one of the things i try to help people understand is like it isn't just about like you feel dirty on your own. It's like you belong to a community that this cuts you off from them. Yeah. It, does, doesn't St. Paul talk mm. about that's why not to have relations with the prostitute because you, you're doing you're, you're joining the Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, and, and this is this is why the inversion man full circle because because it is to say, well, well, where does where does pride day and then week and then month lead? Well, it leads to five-year-old kids yeah. on Saipan holding a flag that's about, you know, sterilization yeah. of of kids there of them. Yeah. That's about them being sterilized and yeah. walking down the street waving it, not knowing yeah. and not possible to understand what it is. And it's just like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Like, I mean, but but it's but it's a logical progression to that. And it's like your thing that you think is just about you. Look behind you mm -hmm. like you screaming and yelling. It's like just for a second, look behind you and be like, is that OK? Just separate of everything. Right. Like it's fine for you to be out here, whatever. I'm not saying anything about you. Turn around, look at this child and be like, is yeah. that OK? Like, could you imagine? Could, could you imagine? If there was some council of, let's say, bishops, right? Let's say this. Let's say such a thing existed, and let's say that this council of bishops, if they loved Christ, if they got together and they really prayed and fasted, and they came out and they and they came out with an actual encyclical talking about Pride Month and these things, and instead of you know, kind of trying to appease both sides and saying we respect this and that they got to the really thing of like as orthodox christians and as the bishops of the church entrusted to with the authority given to us by jesus christ we recognize the tragedy of the multitude of souls that are are lost to their own you know their own egocentric you know mm -hmm. pleasure seeking lives and we, 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 we recognize that this is not what, you know, you see what I'm saying? Something more along the lines of that and really like an actual call to repentance. Can you imagine what that would do? I mean, can you, not just even for like the culture of the city, but even how it would encourage the flock, the faithful to be like, whoa, you know what I mean? To, it would really cause people to go even deeper. You know what I mean? It would cause people to, you know, instead of, <laughs> you know well to having, go to go deeper into their them their own soul father own which which soul. that's that's the thing to where it would be like oh wait i'm not gay i'm not part of doing the yeah. pride thing but oh i yeah. i'm living egocentrically in these very yeah. oh yeah. i'm guilty yeah. of this too like yeah. or how about i this? need healing as well how about this i've been man i have i didn't really realize it but i've been just meditating on how much I want to kill my cousin Libby because she because mm -hmm. she disgusts me. Yeah. I'm actually gonna pray for her. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I'm and I'm actually gonna, you know, try to love her. Like not co-sign, not be like, hey, it's okay. Not that at all. 
But actually, when I, I'm actually going to have the courage to say something because before I didn't say anything because I didn't want to look like the jerk, right? That's still pride yeah. and like whatever, yeah. right? I'm actually going to like pull her aside. I'm actually going to have, I'm actually going to engage her. But I'm going to engage her actually trying to win her. Like yep. not the person on the street, your cousin. Because because that's, I think that's the other part of the quote unquote culture where it's problematic is that Saul's armor doesn't fit, right? So if you remember, if you remember David, you know, he's incensed by the blasphemy of Goliath. He's like, this is insane. Is there no one in Israel who's going to stand up for for the, the righteousness of the Lord. So he goes, he's like, I'm, I'm going to fight this guy. And everyone's like, no, don't do it, David, whatever. And then eventually, you know, Saul goes and goes, well, here's my armor. And David tries on the armor of Saul. He's like, this doesn't fit. Yeah. Right? So he, he, he leaves the armor behind. He finds the five smooth stones. You know what I mean? And he, and he goes and he, he goes to wage war against Goliath. And that's the thing is like, we are trying to put on the armor of Saul. We're trying to put on this armor of trying to meet the culture as the culture is. We, we don't want to seem all the all the things of Christ where the power lies. We don't want to embrace that. We don't want to embrace the cross. We don't want to embrace, you know, this call of bringing people to repentance. It's like <laughs> we would rather look super gnarly mean tough and brutal because we're scared you see what i'm saying but the thing is is christ calls us to something so crazy and radical that we want to wear the armor of saul because of because of fear but it doesn't fit and so that's why not, that's why the quote unquote needle isn't moving because we're trying to engage these issues on the level of these principalities and powers where, excuse me, on the level of the flesh and blood, whereas we're supposed to engage the principalities and the powers, like people don't address the principalities and the powers. They address the flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That's what I mean by the, the Saul's armor doesn't fit. You're trying to fight in a way that isn't meant for you. It isn't meant for the church to fight the way that quote unquote Christians are trying to fight. That's not, that's not our way. And that's, and you know it's not our way because that's why nothing's working, right? That's why the, you're not seeing a real, a real shift, right? Like, forgive me. I think it's great that like, I think it's great on one hand. It can be well. I'm being kind of like whatever I say this, but okay, great. Bud Light's tanking. They're giving it away. Target. Like, I, I get that argument of like hit them in the pocketbook. I get that, right? But I just want to be really clear about something. It doesn't matter because they're still doubling down. Like, that's the thing. People aren't waking up to that. It's like, look how much stock, look how much their, their stock has took a hit. Look at the billions they've lost. It's like, they're still doubling down. Like, you're trying. And, and like, Father, forgive me. Should Orthodox Christians be, be judging our success based on Target stock and what no. what they're doing inside a Target no. store? Like, that's, I think that's, what does that my, have to do with? I think that comes exact from point. like that's my exactly. I think that comes from a, a place of desperation, though. Like mm -hmm. any kind of quote unquote victory, anything because it's such a cavalcade. It's oh, maybe I'm using well. That. That's the trap. It's that's the despair. Sure, you know, that that's been the whole thing. Is that that's what I've seen more than anything is. And, and why, I again, say their degeneracy is your trap is because every person that I see who starts focusing on the, the degeneracy, I see them falling into despair. But that's it's because they can't have it because they're not because it keeps growing like that's... they're trying to do everything and it keeps growing and they fall into despair and then they just lash out. And that's that's kind of why. I wanted to talk and it's uh, like, I'm not, it's not a big thing, but that's kind of what I wanted to talk about anger because like mm -hmm. we watched a certain docu. I did not because I'm not responding well to this stuff right now, but like mm -hmm. we watched a certain documentary by a certain person from the daily wire calling into question. What is a woman? So like, cause it was free. My wife had not seen it before. And it was amazing to me because I don't, she's just, she doesn't have a smartphone. She doesn't have a lot of access to like media 
and she's got three small children. So when does this woman have time to do anything? You know, she just kind of lives her life as a, as a house, uh, as a housewife and as a mother. I don't think she knew how bad things were. And so when she saw it, I saw this little bit of like despair of mm -hmm. like her being like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I had no idea this was going on. And so the problem is, is like, I respond, and this is why I'm kind of dieting from that stuff right now is like the black balls of uh, the black pill stuff, yeah. the stuff of mm -hmm. hopelessness is because like my reaction is of fury. Like I, it disturbs mm -hmm. me. It disturbs me when I see stuff like that, which knows that there's a disorder in me. There's something I'm not seeing correctly. I'm not believing truly in the victory of Christ. I'm not believing that he truly will have the last word. I, I'm I'm seeing the things that are happening and I get mad so much so that like I'm pacing my office. Like I just like, I'm just getting like mad. So I'm kind of dieting from that stuff right now. I just, I can't really handle it until I can figure out you know what that is but i think any kind of victory any if people are so like th because that's their life their lifeblood you know quote unquote mm -hmm. and any little drop from the old rusty disgusting faucet they just like lap it up you know like there's this channel where the dude is anti-woke but he's like a ex-comic book owner or ex-comic book shop owner and he like he just is loving that Disney's not doing so great right now because they're not making very good content because they're prioritizing wokeness over like oh yeah like message. the little the Little Mermaid uh, she's sure. probably going off on the Little Mermaid and all that and this yeah, 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 last yeah. season of Mandalorian which I have not yeah, seen yeah, yeah. but from what I understand I thought it's it was not... great really I it was okay. great. yeah I've I heard think it was great. I've heard some negative things about it but like the thing and the what he calls the MCU. This these last five or six movies or whatever that have just been bad. Yeah, he calls it the MCU, where it's like prioritizing like quote unquote woke politics. But even then, it's like you're it's gross generalizations, and I don't think he's being fair. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. Oh, but, and uh, uh, on that note, Andor, you were right. It's great. As soon as you go past the the third episode, oh it's incredible. yeah, like oh. yeah, it was great. I was like, okay, let me see. Oh, it's so good. It's so yeah, good. I couldn't no, stop it's, watching it. Yeah, it's really it's good. supreme. It's like. Can we just get more of this? Anyway, yeah, really the good. point is, is, is that like, um, I think I've talked to certain people, even in the circles that I run with that, they're like, you know, it's hard not to hop on like the DeSantis train. Like, it's hard not to jump on that train. Do and it's it. like, That's well, crap. no, it's a total dead end. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything. There's nothing there. You're looking to mm -hmm. your orientation is incorrect. And so I think all of this stuff is just the other side of the trap. It's making, you know, as we have said over and over and over again, it's just like this is the way things were right before Hitler rose to power. It was this mm -hmm. kind of debauchery. It was this kind of hedonism. Mm -hmm. It was this kind of like questioning of long established norms that allowed a certain side to si finally rally behind one person to say, like, no, this is the dude. This is the dude that will lead us out of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when that fully becomes both sides finally see oh this is the guy then you know who that is you know we're talking about an mm -hmm. antichrist situation but i think this is the this is one of the like effects i am seeing of the trap is like any kind of like bill that's passed mm -hmm. any kind of like any kind of action that's taken by the right any kind of like potential president potential like uh candidate who's supporting the things that they're talking about. They're just like all on board because that's the only thing that's giving them life is like this idea of like that. My morality will be vindicated at the end of the day that the people who I do not like will be rounded up. Well, it's that rea It's that reaction. They're, they're focused. They're focused outside the door. They're not looking at the altar. 100%. 100%. Yeah. They're turning towards the West. They're looking mm -hmm. at politics. They're looking towards mm -hmm. like an earthly savior. They're looking for their president elects and stuff like that to come and help mm -hmm. save them. And at the end of the day, it's like, I mean, I said this and then I'll be done. I mean, it's like to us Orthodox, we're polishing the brass on the Titanic, but mm -hmm. someone should be polishing it because like mm -hmm. it is going down. But at a certain point, Christ is going to come and bring that sucker back up. So, like, we might as well be polishing the brass on the Titanic because we know it's going down. We're just the only ones who know it's going down or in the way that we do with an eventual resurrection. So I just finished my coffee. I'm going to try and mellow out a little bit. So, 
but we're cut co- we're cl- are we close to two hours now yeah yeah do you we're, have an ending at- question yeah cyprian what do you think of andor no, I'm just kidding. Like it, it's great. <laughs> I it's great. I, yeah. Hey, Father, I actually did have a question. Hmm. It occurred to me, and this is one of those basic questions that occurred to me. I was praying, as I'm one to do sometimes, and it occurred to me what what like in a broad spectrum, because I think that there's a, probably a lot to this, but like how sh- what should a person's reaction be? Like, what is the correct to a correct response to their prayer not being answered? Like, if they're if they've been asking God for a while for something, you know, like maybe a certain person to come to Christ or something like that, or like that some of these like troubles can be alleviated or something like that. What would what should like the correct response to be towards continually asking God? Maybe for keep knocking. Couples? They keep knocking and. Um, knock and it should be open to you ask you shall receive but there's also this space of understanding that if it hasn't been answered the question is if because it could have been and you just weren't listening you could have heard a no mm-hmm. you could have heard it, it, it there could have been a, a no or not yet or wait and a lot of times we don't hear from god because we're just fixated on what we want to hear mm-hmm. so i would say just keep keep knocking and actually say ask yourself, am I actually listening? Right. That's the correct response. Am I actually listening? Do I actually want to hear from God or do I just want to hear what I want to hear? Um, and then from there, you know, just really saying like working on getting your heart to where you actually want God's will um, and understanding that, you know, the way that you see things is definitely not going to be you no know, anywhere near as wise or as good or true as, as God sees it, you know? Mm. So, I mean, that's what he told us, you know? Um, I mean, the, our father, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's why he gave us the, our father. That's what our father is all about. You know? What I, I want to, um, there was something interesting there that I think would have, would have maybe slipped by me at another time in terms of this idea of, prayer being answered i think that that in the western christian context prayer being answered means i asked for the thing and then i got it Mm -hmm. as opposed to prayer being answered could also (laughs) could also be no Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right like that uh, your prayer god can also say no yeah. Like that's the answer. The answer could be yes, or well, the answer could be no. Right? Me, here, here's the thing: God saying no way more than people actually realize. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't like. I think about... I think this is really important to talk about, Father. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I'll just say one of the movements from my own experience about having a prayer life is, you know, you start realizing like. I shouldn't say this, but you know, I don't, I ask for very little from God. My prayer life is not about asking God for things. Um, And I know that's kind of hard for people to to wrap their minds around, but um, you know, this, this transition from seeing, you know, again, God as a genie or even like, you know, Protestantism in many ways is, is, it conditions people to have a pagan approach to prayer and this kind of reciprocation, you know, transactional relation. Prosperity gospel. Yeah. I mean, it's really problematic and it, and it, and it is. So the reasons why people scratch their heads for a long time, because they're like, they're in the liturgy, like this is prayer. You know what I mean? Like how is the liturgy the highest form of prayer for Mm -hmm. the church? Like they don't understand it, you know? And the, the liturgy is, petitions right i mean we're petitioning god mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. don't mistake what i'm saying don't mistake what i'm saying you know but like this the it, it isn't this kind of like um either or thing there's there's there is this state of being in regards of just wanting to be in god with god that i think takes over someone's prayer life and so this is why it gets you to start even asking differently You know, it's like you start asking for God's will on things. You start asking Mm -hmm. for, and and you're able to tell more when something isn't God's will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing. It's like, no, this isn't, this isn't what you want, Lord. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. 
if it's really quick and easy, yeah, there's a good chance. Because intercession's a huge thing, right? Intercession's a huge thing, and that's why, you know, we pray for a president, especially the president you don't like. You know what I mean? Like intercession, hospitality, and intercession are like the two core things about being a Christian. We learned that from Abraham. Mm-hmm. You know, like what mm-hmm. made Abraham a friend of God? Well, he offered hospitality to God. And he also offered intercession on behalf of Lot. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. this intercession, this willingness for hospitality, it's super key. And when Christians don't have either one of them, it's out of balance. But Mm -hmm. a Christian who has this ethos of hospitality and intercession, they're on a good path. Mm -hmm. They'll have a good, healthy prayer life that they will find um, rich. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because that's... that's, um... I have found I'm not quite at the spot where I don't ask God for things. I still ask for God for things pretty regularly, but a little bit of growth I have shown, you know, so far is that I tend to ask if it is your will, yeah. because there's that story of, I believe St. Paisios was um, somewhere, I think like in a hotel or something like that. And he's talking with a man who him and his wife begged for years for a child and they never once asked, like, if it is your will, please, can you give us a child? Please, can you give us a child? Please, can you give us a child? Finally, after years and years and years, they finally conceived a, a son. And years passed, the wife died, and the dad remarried. And one day he came home, and the son and his new wife were in bed together. Yep. Um, and he shot and killed them both. Yep. And uh, served his time in prison, and then now he sat in this hotel room or this, this lobby, whatever, I think, I don't remember exactly with St. Paisios telling him the story. And there was never like, if it is your will, like, cause maybe there's a reason why, you know, this, this thing that you really want, I'm not talking about children right now. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about this thing, this, maybe the school that you really want to get to this car that you want to, you know, this career possibly, maybe even this love interest that like this rom- potential romantic partner might not be good for you. And, I tell people a lot that like uh, there was I, God really prevented a huge disaster. I almost ended up working for um, the organization that kind of made things complicated for us in 2020 um, with our church and everything. I ended up almost working for them. And I was really hurt when I found out that it was n- that they had passed me over for a job. What I thought was going to be my dream job. I was going to be cooking downstairs from the church oh my gosh this is incredible like yes of course this is what god wants for me that probably would have been disastrous like it probably would have been like at really added further complications to my life at a time that i really didn't need complications I, I, it's just so tough but i can say with absolute confidence assurity the majority of things in my life that i and blessed about were things that I did not want or like or resisted yep. initially. I mean, <laughs> I can go on and on and on being in Kansas city. I mean, my wife, I mean, there's, there's so many things where I thought I wanted something else and God in his mercy was patient and allowed me to just experience things. And it's just like, thank you, God. If I had a God, what I wanted, Oh my gosh. I just, there's mm. like, my whole life is that it's like, I'm so thankful that God has said no to me. I, I'm more grateful for the no's than the yes. I, you know what I mean? That's why I always say, ask for closed doors. Absolutely. Don't ask God for open doors. Ask God for closed doors. The closed doors are what you want. God's no is, is his love. You don't want a yes because you're, man, I could, we could spend a whole other two hours of me telling you stories not just from other people, but my own life, where it's just like, man, if I hadn't had a yes, oh my gosh, I'd be in, I'd be in a living hell. So, pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. Perfect. Yeah, that Perfect. I that I just heard that phrase for the first time not too long ago, and it really hit me. I was like, pride cometh before the fall, like, or pride goes before the fall. I was like, oh wow. That is absolutely 100% true. Like that on a macro and a micro level, it's just like every time when you see someone getting really puffed up, 
it's like, man, your head is barely fitting through the door and God's going to have to mm. pop it. Like, in which like, is, which is why you actually don't have to respond to if, if your enemy is deciding that what they're going to do is they're going to have a whole month where they celebrate their pride. You could you're you don't need to do anything. Just step yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> you know what comes next for yeah. them. If that's really your enemy, don't get just, embroiled in it. Yeah, just just step back and be like, oh, you want your pride? Have your pride. I'll be patient over here because I know where you're going. I so, mean, uh, do your thing. <laughs> as part of my prayer rule, we can end on this. But like, as I'm part of my prayer rule, I'm I'm reading or praying Psalm 77 right now, which is. If, if I hadn't been reading it right now, I would not be familiar with it. But since I'm reading it right now, I am familiar with it. And the whole thing is just God's interaction with Israel right after they leave Egypt. Like the whole thing. And like, it's like God would have loved to take care of you. He absolutely would have loved to take care of you. And there's like even a part where he's like, then God arose as a man heavy with wine, heated with wine. Yeah, smacked, oh, love that. Smacked their that smacked the translation I'm reading is like smacked their enemies on their hinder parts. And I was like, <laughs> wow, that's one of my favorite <laughs> psalms of all time. Like talking about God being arose like or like a man out of sleep, heated with wine, smacking their enemies' hinder parts. I was like, man, <laughs> that's that is awesome. Like I absolutely love that. But like the whole thing. Is God just like, you know what? You can have your lusts. Do whatever you want. I'll be here when you're done. And yeah, I'm just like, yeah, 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 man, yeah. God is so cool. Because he's just like, yeah, go ahead. Do your thing. Whatever. I'm sure it will end great for you this time. Right. When you fall, and you will, I'll be here for you. Stay but it's here. like, man, that's how you know it's God. That's how you know that like, because God allows us to do the things that we're going to do. And then when we're like, when we come crashing down, he's like, hi, honey, how are you? It's been a little while, huh? Like, let's, let's try again this time. Right. And it's like, and I don't know. And like the other part of that Psalm is like, he continually shows his mercy like time and time and time again. He just lets it happen to you, which is what a good dad does. But it's just like exactly. what a really, really good dad does. So exactly. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, what do we, oh, so there is a new contact email. I'm, I've been told that people are contacting it. So contact at Royal pot, Royal path dot network dot network. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, we have a merch store, Royal path dot store. Yep. yep. Uh, and Correct. that is all of our merch. Uh, two thirds of that goes to our, <coughs> parish, our parish. And then the other third goes to the person who makes it. We don't see any of that money. Um, we have a playlist on Spotify. Anytime we mention music, we try and stick it up there uh, and so that you guys can check out what we're listening to or whatever, whatever we were listening to. Hazel's great, point. by the way. What's that? The Witch Hazel is great, by the way. Witch Hazel is fantastic. It's, it's, just, it's really good. It's, yeah. I don't know what it is. It taps into a vein. That's yeah. one of those things. It's like, I didn't know I needed this until yeah. I have it. And then I'm like, oh man, this is so good. It's like, I can't, I can't think of a one for one word, but anyway. Um, and then Apple, Apple podcasts and Amazon. People have been asking, even there was a comment on the last one about someone was like, I want to add it to the So anchor.fm, you can find it. If you want the RSS feed, I also have started putting the RSS feed in the description for people who are asking, they got their own podcast thing. Apple Podcasts were there, Amazon Podcasts were there, Spotify were there, YouTube were there. So you should be able to find the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no excuses now, you, you <laughs> buddies. Um. Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you, and have a good. Thank you for having a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.